Thank you for downloading our podcast or watching our sermon series. It is very important that we know the God we worship. It is also imperative that we discern how God defines himself in his word. If we do not take the time to know our God, we will never know ourselves. We might think we can never know God. When we really think about God, we can see some apparent tension. How can we say, for instance, that God is simple on the one hand, but also incomprehensible? How can we say that God is separate, but also personal at the same time? These are just some of the instances. Please join us as we seek to answer these questions and many more, and remind ourselves that we are the creatures, and He is the great Creator King. As I mentioned, we're almost done with the attributes of God. Lord willing, next week we'll conclude with God being good. And then we'll, Lord willing, move on to the seven sermons in Revelation. And I have eight weeks, at least eight weeks were suggested. It makes sense. So anyway, there was a little conference at Bethel yesterday for pastors uh, that I went to. It was pretty encouraging. Uh, But anyway, as we consider the attributes of God and who God is with God being just, uh, we know that God being just means that it's communicating God is righteous. We've talked about uh, God having a communicable and incommunicable attributes, so the incommunicable attributes are those things that are unique to God. The communicable attributes are those things that are uh, communicated to us, that we share with God, although not in perfection as God possesses them. So the justice of God is something that's in God and also uh, in us. Now in terms of this doctrine of God being just and understanding the doctrine of justification, uh, this is one of those things that was very controversial at the Reformation because uh, the Roman Catholics would say if we talk about a free grace uh, that's freely given to God's people, Merely because of Christ, that we have a declaration of righteousness, we have Christ's righteousness freely given to people, people will live as hellions, right? If there's no fear of of God and and all the dread of judgments taken away, well then God's people will live any way they want. But we think also of even today, this is still something that's somewhat controversial, uh, unfortunately. Uh, We think about... uh, I guess that's 20 years now, but you think about the federal vision and some of the theology there, where you have, you know, we're justified by our covenant faithfulness. So they take justification, sanctification, put these two blessings together and say that, yes, there's a declaration, but it's also as we live in that declaration that we attain the fullness of justification. We think even Uh, Back in the 19th century, it wasn't popularized then, but you had liberal theology talking about God being love, right? So the emphasis was all the passages of God being love, and and justice was sort of put off to the side, that we don't want to talk about God being just. And so when we talk about God being just and and assert this, and again, in, in our tradition, As you're familiar, when we have our confessions, I take vows to uphold these confessions, so I I obviously don't have problems with what the confession is saying. But there is something when we look at God being just, I mean, what does that fundamentally mean? How how just is God? And secondly, what what does this fundamentally mean for us? If God is just, how, how does this encourage us? And so we'll see God is just and we are just, just simply Dividing that, we look at this from God's view, and we look at this, how it becomes our blessing. So we talk about God being just in in terms of the language of the Belgic Confession, and we just sort of teach the logic of what the Confession is doing. What has the Confession taught us? Well, we know that there is one God. So it means there is one sovereign over all. So there is no other God to which we can appeal. There is one God. That's it. God is simple and spiritual. So when we use this language, we're saying uh, that God is uh, not made of complex parts. God doesn't need to sleep. Uh, God is not going to have parts that fail. And so it's important to understand that as God is simple and spiritual, uh, he is a God who does not have a body. He is spirit. He is God who truly is everywhere present at once. And so all these Uh, attributes are are included in that 
as we went through it. We think of God being eternal. We said God has no beginning, he has no end. Uh, God is incomprehensible. So we can know God, we just can't know him exhaustively. God is invisible, so we're not able to see God. Uh, God is one who is immutable. He does not change. He is consistent. God is infinite, where he is everywhere present at once. God is almighty, so there is no power beyond him. Uh, God is perfectly wise, so we said with what God knows perfectly, he executes in perfect wisdom, right? So wisdom, application of knowledge. So when we look at this and we think about God being just, it's important to put just in the context of all these attributes of God and what we've seen in Scripture. Because if God is, is just, and as we look at these other attributes, God can see all things at once. God knows our hearts exhaustively. We're not going to be able to trick God, deceive God. Uh, he's the one who's going to execute his justice with perfection. So you think about that and you say, well, here's the only true God. He is the only one who executes his will. Nothing can overpower his will. Nothing can interfere with his will. We, we can't appeal his will and, and who he is. I mean, we, we can offer our prayers, but what God has revealed is what he's revealed. This is who God is. And so when we think about that, we say, well, we're, we're mortals, right? And we're fallen mortals. And if God is, is perfectly just, we say, how in the world do, do we get out uh, of the tyranny and potential tyranny of this just God? So you can understand, in the 19th century, people saying, well, God is love. You know, God isn't just. Don't worry about it. But the reality is the Apostle Paul is teaching us God is just. So it, it, it'd be nice if we could just say, well, God's not really like that, and he's not really just, so, so don't worry about it. I mean, wouldn't that be great if we could just make up who God is uh, on a whim? But that's not how it works. And if we start emphasizing that God is just love, I mean, certainly, justice and mercy, as we'll see uh, next time with the all-overflowing fountain of good, as the Belgic Confession words it, when you think about this justice and, and mercy, well, he is just. He is merciful. But these are kept in perfect balance, perfect symmetry in who God is. And when you think about the, the language, as Paul uses language in terms of, of who God is and his righteousness and what's revealed in verse 21, the thing of the righteousness of God being manifested in Christ apart from the administration of Moses. It's Dekaiosune, it's a stated righteousness. It's what's right, it's what's just. And this means that, that God has manifested his righteousness perfectly. So when you look at the Mosaic order, when you look in, at least in Romans 3 in the context here, by and large as it's using law, it's not just referring to Torah. Sometimes you can go in Paul's writings or Psalm 119, it can just be referring to instruction. But here in Romans 3, when he's talking about the manifestation of the law, it seems pretty consistent. It's a manifestation of what you see with the administration of Moses, right? So if you think of Moses, Leviticus, you have all the rules and regulations as to how the people of God are going to show their righteousness. You have an imperfection outside the camp. Imperfection, go through these purity rites, and then you can attain uh, access back to the camp. You sin, well, maybe you're executed. Or you sin, here's an offering for that sin or payment that's rendered, right? So there's a manifestation and an overwhelming understanding of man's imperfection before the living God. And so Paul's saying that, that this righteousness that is manifested is showing the perfection of what God expects. And he's speaking here uh, through the law and the prophets as they bear witness to Christ. Now when we look at this and we say, okay, what, what, is, what is this telling us about God's righteousness? Well, when we look at verse 23, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is a universal statement. The Apostle Paul is a very clear communicator. The Apostle Paul doesn't make hasty statements. So when he uses the language of all, you have to look in the text and say, what does he mean by all? Well, there's no qualification here. He's saying that all human beings, 
have fallen short of the glory of God. We have then in verse 24, we have that there's a promise that as we fall short, that there's those who are justified merely as a gift that we have with this declaration that's made. And it's only in Christ Jesus. So it's telling us then, verse 21, the manifestation of Christ, we're those who are not going to attain this righteousness by our own strength. We all need Christ. Uh, that's the only way you have life. But as Paul goes on and we think about the significance of God's righteousness, we have in verse 21, as I call the attention to us, that we have there the situation of this dikaiosune, this righteousness or the root of this, uh, declaring to us the definitive righteousness of God that is manifested in Christ. Verse 22, we have there the righteousness manifested through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 25, God's righteousness is shown as he passes over the former sins. So now this isn't saying God's flippant or inconsistent. It's talking about uh, how there's a time where the Gentiles are out and now the Gentiles are brought in with Christ is what he's uh, sp speaking of there. Verse 26, a demonstration of his righteousness. So when we look at this and we know of what God is doing, it is not that God is somehow uh, flippant or, or that God is one uh, who is not making clear about who he is. He is the one who is definitively righteous. Now, as I mentioned, the way it was manifested was through the law. So this is an important understanding. You think about the manifestation of the Mosaic arrangement. How does Israel do as a national people? They end up in exile. They don't do well. The covenant of grace underneath that, that continues on an individual level, that's the only source of hope. But in terms of the Mosaic arrangement, no, they don't do well. This administration doesn't demonstrate that they will attain perfection. And so that's what Paul wants us to understand. So the Jewish people who hear this say, well, I'm part of Moses. I have Abraham. I'm set. Apostle Paul is saying no, no one is righteous in the presence of God. It's not by genealogy. It's not by being identified in the Mosaic arrangement. It's not by claiming Moses and the prophets in terms of your specific genealogical or, or family history. That's not what saves you. So it's telling us that this is, is setting a stage for all humanity to be in a serious predicament. And as Paul goes on with his righteousness that's manifested in Christ, it means that there is this level playing field. There, there's not a single individual that can claim a, a significance in and of themselves. So when you think about this place of where we are, the holiness of God, God manifesting his righteousness, God showing his righteousness, demonstrating it, this is something that becomes rather frightening. Because if we are 0.01% out of line, so, so let's say we're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to try and I'm going to please God in my works. The moment you are momentarily, for, for a split second, distracted is a reminder that you have fallen short. So even if you say, well, I'm going to try and do this, I'm going to try and step out. Think about that. 0.01% is enough to lead to your condemnation. So we're not even talking about the understanding of Adam being our federal head or Christ being our federal representative. We're, we're not speaking of even the, the federal representation. What Paul's dealing with is that hypothetical situation. Oh, well, I'm Jewish. I'm going to step out and do it. And Paul's saying, really? How did it go? Here we have the Mosaic arrangement. Can, can you really claim that you're righteous and pure? This is how holy our God is. This is how pure and righteous our God is. And then you understand that God can peer straight into our hearts and he can see the moment we've been distracted. The moment we have failed, he can see it. We're not going to lie about it. We're not going to deceive him. 
And so the Apostle Paul is intending to weigh us down with the burden of recognizing, I am not righteous enough to come into the presence of God. So if we look at just the justice of God, we realize we have a pretty big problem. Because we are not going to enter into his presence in our own strength. He knows where we have failed. He knows where we have been distracted. He knows where we have wandered in our affections. So this is where it becomes very important in terms of understanding how are we just? How are we declared righteous? Right? I I always go back to the quote from Calvin, and it's an important quote. And it's something that, that we have to remember. As long as Christ remains outside of us, he is of no benefit to us. So if we look... And verse 21, and we understand that Christ is the one who redeems us once for all, which we believe. But if he is just there manifesting the righteousness of God, right? So we just say, 3 verse 21 stands on its own and nothing else in the context. Well, we're in a horrible situation then. Because all we have is we have somebody who has shown us that it's possible to live a righteous life before God. Well, that, that does us nothing, right? If, if Christ is just an example, as some of the liberals have said, and even today people will say, well, Christ is a good teacher. I believe Jesus is a good teacher. Well, I, I guess that's better. If, I'd rather live in a moral society than an immoral society. That's, that's true. But it's still not Christian. Because if Christ is just showing us righteousness, it does nothing for us. It's merely taunting us it's merely holding out for us further condemnation there's no hope in that and so that's why we got to go beyond verse 21 and see what the apostle paul's doing here because if christ is just in heaven christ has just shown us we can do it well that that does nothing we're in a pitiful situation and this is why when we look at our tradition growing out of the reformation and what our catechism teaches I want to just go through a couple of question and answers that, that summarize this, right? So you think of it, question and answer 20, where it says, Are all men then saved by Christ as they have perished in Adam? And it says, No, only such who by true faith are engrafted into him and receive all his benefits. So right there, our, our catechism wants to labor this point as it's understanding the Apostle Paul That as we take hold of Christ by faith, we receive all his benefits. We don't earn them. We don't merit them. We receive them as we take hold of Christ by faith. Going on in the catechism, question answer 53. What do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? It says, first, that he is co-eternal with God, with the Father and the Son. Secondly, that he has also given unto me makes me by true faith a partaker of Christ and all his benefits, comforts me and shall abide with me forever. Right here, it's assuring us that as we have faith, it's the Holy Spirit that has given us and granted us this faith. Ephesians 2.8, it's a gift from God, right? I mean, that's the force of this. And so this is very important. On the one hand, we can be conscious. How do I know if I have the Spirit? Do you have faith? If you have faith, it's because you have the Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit, you're grafted into Christ. Now, question and answer 60, I encourage you to study that on, on your own, but I'm just going to call to your attention just a little bit of this answer. And the question is, how are we righteous before God? And it goes through how we are those who are tormented, you know, our consciences accuse us and and we're those who understand we're sinners we need grace hopefully right but it says in terms of of receiving the blessings of Christ without any merit of mine of mere grace grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction righteousness and holiness of Christ so answer 60 setting exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying here in Romans 3. An imputation is a crediting. So Adam's failure, credited to us. Christ's imputation is his success, credited to us. 
And as, as we have this, it's understanding that Christ is the one who credits us with this perfection. But we also receive his righteousness and holiness. Now, you talk to some Roman Catholic theologians, they will speak of an imputation that Christ gives, but we're not imputed with his righteousness or holiness. So we're credited with um, some of the meritorious accomplishments of Christ, but it's not the fullness in the sense of the ethics and, and the, uh, the, the priestly perfection of Christ, of his righteousness and his holiness given to us. That's why the Catechism adds this in 60. So for, for Rome, it's you're credited, you begin the process of justification, and you can attain the perfect righteousness. What the Catechism is telling us, and what I'd argue the Apostle Paul is, and we'll dive deeper into Romans 3 here in a moment, is that we have to understand that we don't just have Christ's work credited to us and he's distant from us and he's up in heaven, but that we're actually united to our Lord and Savior receiving his distinct blessings. And that he's the one who gives us everything so we're, we are declared his children. Now as we go on, there's obviously the objection, doesn't this make men careless and profane? And answer 64 is no, for it's impossible for those who are implanted into Christ by true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. And again, I love that. Fruits of thankfulness, right? It's not meritorious accomplishments showing our worthiness to receive Christ's grace. No, these are fruits of thankfulness as we are engrafted into Christ. And again, lastly, question and answer 21, dealing with faith. What is true faith? Well, the answer is it's that knowledge and it's that trust. Uh, some translations say conviction. So the reality of it is you know who Christ is. You're convicted. You walk in the power of this as you are made alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. So this faith is something that is conscious that the Holy Spirit is at work in us as we sojourn under the sun. So now as we've summarized this doctrine where I think the catechism is helpful, and again, I, I encourage our kids if you're wrestling with these doctrines, it's so good to go into the catechism and understand that there's a little proof text and look those proof texts up to understand where we're getting this and how we're pulling this theology together. But now as we sort of summarize this doctrine, let's go back into Romans 3. And remember, as long as Christ is outside of us, he is of no benefit to us. So look at Romans 3, verse 9 through 18. Here the Apostle Paul quotes uh, Psalm 14 and various other places in the Psalms recounting how wicked and depraved humanity is. It's pretty universal and scary. No one is righteous. No, not one. I mean, think about that. All of us are corrupted because of what Adam has done. Not a single one of us is righteous. Verse 18, what, what a tragic statement. There is no fear of God. I mean, think about that. No, no fear of God? I mean, he, he is the sovereign king. Uh, you, you start thinking about his righteousness and where we stand before that. That's pretty frightening. He can peer right into your heart, know exactly what's going on. You think you're going to stand before this God and, and you're going to prevail on your own merits and accomplishments? None of you truly understand who he is. Going on then, 3, 19 <clears throat> and 20. So we know that uh, when he talks about being under the law and the administration of the law. He's speaking here and making explicit that anyone who tries to, to do this law and, and tries to, to make this their purpose or orientation of justification, they're not going to achieve it. If you really look at the law and you really study the administration of Moses, really understand it, we're going to know we're sinners. If we're really looking at it and really conscious of what's going on here, it's driving home that reality. It's instructing us, you are not going to earn the blessings of Christ in and of yourself. Can't do it. Impossible. We are going to come to a true knowledge of our sin. We're going to recognize that we are sinners and we are not able to come into the presence of God. Now we go on and we think about the reality of, of this statement. And we say, well, how, how do we know that, you know, we're, we're going to have life? How can there be 
any assurance of this? How, how do we know that, that there's hope, right? I mean, our catechism tells us there's hope. And I think our catechism is rightly understanding Romans 3 as it's summarizing Romans 3 and other passages in Scripture. But how do we really know we have hope? Well, this is where we look again. Because again, his, Paul's point is not just to beat us up, but it is to bring us low. It really is. It's to remind us that, that, that the law serves this first use of conviction, of showing us that we're not going to attain uh, the standard of God. But as he goes on, notice these, these key words. Verse 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift. Now this justification is a declaration of righteousness. Uh, so this is basically, I mean it really is a word in, in the Greek that means you're in legal trouble. You need to figure out how to get out of this legal trouble. Uh, so this justification is basically think of it as acquittal. So it's the heavenly courts legally acquitting you, declaring you righteous, declaring you right before the throne of God. So that's the first thing that Paul calls our account of what's happened in the transaction of Christ and going on on the cross. But notice that in verse 24, he goes on where he speaks of his justification being a gift. So we don't merit this, we, we don't attain it. But he says also redemption, verse 24. Redemption, you can find this in the Old Testament, also in the time uh, when Paul writes this letter. Uh, redemption is a releasing from debt. Redemption is associated normally with slavery, uh, where someone cannot repay a debt. Uh, you have instances, for instance, where somebody tries to stay at an inn, can't settle the, the, the bill at the end of the stay, they get sold into slavery. Uh, somebody can't make good on some other deficit, they get sold into slavery. So what happens is somebody will come along and pay a redemption. So it's, it's whatever the deficit is plus the interest, and it's making a, a legal payment so they are released from the obligation of that debt. Uh, probably one of the best ways to communicate this in, in our society, if you think about yourself uh, upside down in, in a mortgage, uh, you're going to have your house foreclosed on. Somebody comes along and doesn't just make the mortgage a full you know, or up to date, but they actually may bring it up to date and pay the whole mortgage off and would give you the house still to live in, right? So that would be, you know, you, you could understand uh, sort of this overwhelming reality. I moved from being homeless to now being someone that owns my home whole, right? So that's the, the communication of this redemption. You're a slave, you have no rights, now you're made whole and you have rights. So hopefully that puts you in a situation where you go, wow, what a wonderful position to be in considering where I was yesterday and where I am today, right? That's, that's the force of redemption. My goodness, I, I can't believe I am put in this position today. So that's what, what Paul's communicating here. Declared righteous, ready, legal trouble. Your legal trouble is taken away. You're about to be homeless, now you're made whole, and you have your house, and you're a full homeowner, right? Wonderful. And we say, but then, how does this transaction take place? I mean, is it gold? Is it silver? Peter tells us it's not gold or silver. And Paul himself adds to this, where he says, whom God put forward as a propitiation. Now, we don't always know what this word means. Uh, this is a word that comes from the Old Testament, and this is a significant payment as well. It's a beautiful thing. It's not beautiful for whoever makes a payment because it is communicating a blood sacrifice and blood offered to make payment. So for the, the one that offers it, it's not a beautiful thing. But for those who receive the blessings of it, it's an incredibly beautiful thing. Uh, we find this in, in the Old Testament and how this is uh, presented where you can see it in Leviticus 16, again used in the Greek translation the Hebrew Bible called the Septuagint and this is used in the concept of, of the mercy seat in the Day of Atonement and when you have this this mercy seat the picture that Paul wants to call to our mind is this wonderful picture of Christ and again it's tragic and wonderful at the same time 
But what happens with the priest going into the, the most holy place in the Day of Atonement, making the sacrifice, sprinkling the blood is done in secret, right? You see the priest go in, he makes a sacrifice, and you hope he comes out unscathed. As he walks out, I mean, that's a wonderful thing. It means the sacrifice has been offered, but it's sort of this nail-biting experience. In terms of what Paul is saying here with Christ being the propitiation, he's driving home to first century Christians who may have heard that there's this kooky guy who died on a cross who really believes some system, right? And so that's a narrative that's going out. And Paul's saying, don't see him as some sort of a radical revolutionary. Paul's saying this is actually orchestrated by the plan of God. And so what's done in secret in the temple, that the Jewish people would understand this, he's saying is publicly displayed for all to see, with Christ being placed upon the cross, being this offering, this sacrifice, this payment of blood, so that the wrath of God is taken away. The very thing that's sprinkled on the mercy seat is what happens on the cross. And so when we look at this and we say, okay, now it's making sense. Why is it that God's divine forbearance has been put off? Because again, somebody can read that and say, see, God's arbitrary, he's not really just, what are you talking about? Well, what Paul's emphasizing there is you would have uh, the Day of Atonement, where you would have the priest making the sacrifice, this is something offered primarily for Jewish people, right? Gentiles don't normally have access to this. Gentiles uh, may be able to come in, but they're still in the outer courts, reminded of their distinction from the pure Jewish line. Now, he's saying, as, as the Lord has sort of passed over that, they didn't have the symbolism, he's saying this is what all of it pointed to. It was models, it was anticipations of the reality of what God intended to be done in Christ. So it's not that God just overlooked former sins. It wasn't that God said, well, you know, it wasn't really a big deal when they did it in the Old Testament. Now it's a big deal. (laughs) That's not the point. The point is they didn't have access to the temple. And now as they look upon Christ, Jew, Gentile must look to the true substance of what the mercy seat and a day of atonements ultimately pointing to. So when we we hear this reality, we say, okay, so this is where we go back to, how does this become ours? Well, we have there that verse 24, justified by his grace as a gift. When Paul speaks of a gift, Ephesians 2.8, we think of this language, the gift of faith. As you take hold of Christ by faith, this blessing is your blessing. That's the beauty of what he's saying here. This blessing is your blessing. You possess this. And so as he's going on through the end of the chapter from verse 27, going on uh, through verse verse 31, this is where he's going through basically the, the potential objector, the hypothetical objector, if you will, or maybe it was an actual interaction that Paul had where somebody says, yeah, but I'm Jewish, I'm significant. And Paul's saying, no. All of us find our significance in the same Christ. You go on, you read Romans 4, that's the very point he's making with Abram. Abram, Abraham, is looking to the same Christ, justified through the same means, only through faith. So when we look at this declaration, we say, okay, well, this is wonderful again, but then how do we really know that this is mine? Notice then as we back up in the context of the setting of this letter in 2 verse 29. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but by God, or from God. So we say, well then, why is Paul going into this tirade? Well, 2 verse 29, he's picking up again in Romans 4. Romans 3 is where Paul is doing this interjection of saying, this is why we need the Spirit. This is why we need to believe in Christ. Christ isn't just an option. He isn't just a way to heaven. He is the only way to truly enter in to heaven. He is the only means. And so Romans 3 is saying, no one's righteous. doesn't matter if you're a Jew. doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. All of us need the same Christ. 
And so, as we go on, Romans 6, and we think about the Spirit again and how we have this new life. And we say, well, then what about our living out of gratitude? Well, this is why in Reformed theology we speak of justification and sanctification as being distinct yet inseparable. Now, if we don't put those two words together, we're going to have a problem. If we just say distinct, we're going to say, oh, well, now I'm justified, so I better go out and worry about my sanctification in my own strength and in my own power. Well, it's the same spirit, same power, same Christ that is at work within us. If we deny that they are distinct and just say they're inseparable, well, now we get to a place where we say, well, I better earn uh, God's favor and I better live out in this justification and show my faithfulness to God. And if I'm faithful enough, he'll love me. But this is why our catechism draws this reality. It is impossible for those who are engrafted into Christ not to bring forth fruits of gratitude. Because when we understand that the same Christ who offers himself makes payment for us is the same Christ who continues to conform us. This is one of the brilliant things I still argue from Walter Marshall where Walter Marshall says if we are not assured of our declaration of righteousness in Christ we will not grow because we cannot come before the Lord in true introspection and truly look within ourselves and see where we fall short because we'll never have the confidence that Christ really has taken away our sins. But when we understand Christ has taken away our sins, we can truly come before the Lord and truly pray before him and truly ask him to search our hearts and truly desire to conform to him as we walk in the power of his spirit. So in conclusion then, when we return to our question, what does this mean? that God is just. How does this fundamentally impact us? Well, if we're going to set out in an endeavor of trying to earn some sort of a accomplishment or favor of God, Paul's point, Romans 3, you're going to fall flat. It's not going to happen. You, you won't attain it. It's impossible. The standard is so high, it is impossible. So when we understand then, what, how do we receive this if God is so holy? Well, that's why the Lord pours out his wrath upon Christ. It's not to show that he's an angry, vindictive being, as some theories of the atonement are. It's not that God's just saying, hey man, if I do this to a perfect son, imagine what I'll do to you if you mess up. That, that's not the point. And that's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. It truly is transactional. Christ is taking our sins upon himself, receiving the wrath of God, and he is one who is truly a perfect sacrifice. And as he does this, he is one who takes away our sin. As he takes away our sin, we are those that as we take hold of him by faith, are assured that all his blessings, his distinct blessings, his distinct benefits, as our catechism says, are our benefits. And we walk in the power of of his spirit, as the Lord is the one who graciously grants us his spirit as a gift. So we say, well then, how does this impact us? Well, we walk in the power by faith, in the power of the spirit, as his redeemed saints. And we see ourselves as children of God, redeemed in Christ, made alive in Christ, oriented to heaven, seated with him in heaven, saying amen to his promises and walking in light of them. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. 
Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.